for the time that we spend in Luke, we are in the last chapter. We're nearing the end of the book, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to be looking at verse 13 through 35 this morning. So if you want to follow along in scripture, it's Luke 24, 13 through 35. And the title of the message is The Living Word. The Living Word. Who is Jesus? That might be a loaded question, a question that we're probably not going to be able to take 40 minutes and fully answer. Uh, if we spent time talking about Christology and the life of, uh, or the life of Jesus, his ministry, but even his identity, uh, we could spend a long time discussing that. But a couple of the basics. He is God, right? He's the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. He became a man and he dwelt among people. And yet, even in his humanity, he did not cease to be God. In theology, we call this the hypostatic union. Uh, It's the incomprehensible union of the divine nature and the human nature in one person, Jesus. Fully God, we say, and fully man. This is the marvelous truth of the incarnation. So as Jesus lived on the earth, he was God. And what he said was filled with the weight and the authority of God. This is why on numerous occasions as people listen to him teach, like they said in Luke 4.32, they were astonished at his teaching for his words possessed authority. They were very different than the words that they had heard from other teachers. They, Jesus spoke, and as he spoke, God spoke. So to listen to Jesus was to listen to God. His words are spoken in not only the authority of God, but they are filled with truth. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit in his mouth. Everything Jesus said was truth. He's the living, walking, breathing word of God. We come to John 1.14, talking about Jesus and the word, what? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we have God the Son, the one who spoke the universe into existence. And he is described as the Word. A God who communicates and who acts through speech. Jesus, the Word, taking on then human flesh. And he walked and he talked and he communicated with people. But here's the significance. You have Jesus, the living word, as he spoke and taught on the earth. Often, he relied upon and he communicated with the written word of God. Now we see this time and again. At the beginning of his ministry, when he was tempted by Satan, what was his response to those temptations? It is written. It is written. It is written. And he goes back and he reminds Satan of what the written word of God says. When Jesus taught in the synagogue of Nazareth, he began by reading and then teaching from where? The prophet of Isaiah, right? He goes back to Scripture. When he was explaining who John the Baptist was, Jesus referred to the prophet Malachi. When Jesus was asked on one occasion about inheriting eternal life, he pointed his listeners to the law of God. Even when he was cleansing the temple, he quoted another passage from Isaiah. So time and again, you have the living word of God and he's quoting to and he's referring to the written word of God. Jesus recognized, relied upon, and demonstrated that God's written word was alive. It was powerful. Now Jesus was God. He could have spoken new revelation on any of those previous occasions. He didn't have to refer to the written word of God. But instead, he chose to use the written word of God. And this demonstrates not only that God's word never changes, but that God's people can have confidence in the written word of God. They can believe it. They can share it with confidence. 
When God's word is proclaimed, it goes forth with authority and it goes forth with the very life and power of God himself. That's why we read in Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, for the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from his sight. Verse 13, if you heard that, no creature is hidden from not its sight, but his sight. It's a living word of God. So when we spend time with God's word, when we interact with God's word, we are interacting with the God of the universe and the Savior of our souls. Now we're going to see that very truth in the account before us, and we're going to be encouraged to spend time with the word of God. And you can take that both ways. With the written word of God and the living word of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And to do that this morning, we're just going to look at this narrative really in three responses that we have to this narrative. First, we want to consider Jesus. Then second, we want to learn from Jesus. And then finally, third, we want to proclaim Jesus. So let's consider Jesus, verses 13 through 24. And we want to consider Jesus along with those disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now, so far, up to this point in Luke, we have not seen the risen Savior. We've seen the empty tomb. We've heard the report uh, from the women that there was the message of the angels that he is alive. Uh, We have watched Peter go and examine the empty tomb for himself. And now we go along a dusty path between Jerusalem and this village of Emmaus. It's still Sunday. The first day of the week, the third day after Jesus died, the confusion, the excitement of the morning's reports are fresh in our minds. Verse 13, that very day, two of them, two of the disciples, this isn't one of the 11, but it was two of those other disciples that the women came back and told about the empty tomb. Two of these disciples, they may have been friends, possibly even a husband and wife, And they were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. The exact location of Emmaus is no longer known to us, but Luke tells us it was actually literally 60 stadia, which works out to about 6.8 miles, approximately seven miles from Jerusalem. And normal walking speeds, this would be nearly a two-hour journey on foot. Now later, they end up in a home. We're going to see that eating food. So it's very possible that these disciples were not from Galilee, but actually were from down in that village of Emmaus going home uh, after the excitement of the, uh, the weekend with the Passover and then the excitement of the morning with the reports about the empty tomb. And as the two journeyed together, verse 14, they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened So we hear their conversation, and they're talking about the death and the burial, and, well, now the strange reports of a possible resurrection of Jesus. And they don't know what to make about this. So they are just passing the miles and the time, uh, talking with one another, and that's what we do as people, right? God is a God who speaks, and a God who communicates with words, and he's created us to do the same. And so when we can't figure something out, or we're bewildered, or we have something on our mind, we, we oftentimes like to, to talk with someone else about it. And that's what they're doing. Even if you don't come to the conclusion, they are still bewildered. They're, they're just discussing what had happened. And this is a perfect opportunity. Verse 15, well, while they were talking and they're discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. He comes alongside them. He listens to a little bit of their conversation. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, the risen Savior, on a number of occasions, he was unrecognizable, at least at first, to the people that he was going to reveal himself to. God initially hid Jesus' identity, because later they do recognize him. But God puts kind of a veil, a spiritual veil, if you will, that when they're looking at him, they can't see him at first. And this is going to be purposeful. This is going to be purposeful. It's intentional. Now, we might just expect Jesus to simply reveal himself to these beloved followers and say, look, I am alive. You can believe now. The reports you have heard is true. If I put myself, I probably shouldn't do this in Jesus' position, and I have been risen from the dead, 
you know, I would probably want to pop around, out around the corner and say, hey, it's me, right? I mean, just look, I want to see the surprise in someone's face. But here Jesus is walking along and he doesn't actually reveal himself to them, not initially. Verse 17, and he said to them, well, what is this conversation? He starts entering into the conversation with them. He says, what, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And look at their response, these two disciples. They hear this, really, the stranger's question. They don't know Jesus. it's Jesus as of yet. And they stood still, and they look sad. Their countenance drops, gloomy, downcast. And they were surprised. They were surprised that anyone who was coming from Jerusalem had not heard of what had taken place over the last couple of days. Verse 18, then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? He almost seems to speak this question more rhetorically, kind of like, I'm I'm shocked that you haven't heard this. And this is Cleopas. Now, truthfully, we don't know anything. This is about this man. This is the only time he's mentioned in Scripture. We're never told the name of the other disciple with Cleopas. Perhaps Luke believed his readers would know who this particular disciple was. It may have even been as Luke compiled the account that he actually talked to Cleopas and and heard uh, from him personally this account. But Cleopas, in sorrow, he responds and he asks this man from Jerusalem how he did not know what took place. And we really kind of see the irony, though, in this passage, because here he is asking Jesus, how do you not know what took place? And here is Jesus who knew better than anyone else what had taken place. And yet Jesus doesn't even reveal that yet. Instead, verse 19, Jesus said to them, well, what things? What things? Jesus, the greatest teacher that ever lived, He asks really good questions, and that's what he does here. He wants to lead them down a path of considering. So he says, what things? Tell me. Let's consider together what you have observed, what you know to be true, what has happened. It would be a foundation upon which he will then later proclaim truth to them. And so Jesus asks him really to tell him what took place, verse 19, and it just kind of comes bubbling out of both of them. They start telling Jesus what happens. And they said to him, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us, well, they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had seen, but him they they did not see. So they just recount everything that had happened over the weekend over the last number of days, and they first share with Jesus, but they tell Jesus about whom they are discussing, and this is Jesus of Nazareth, a, a, a great teacher. He was a prophet of God, and so these disciples, they believed that he was a prophet of God. They, they had watched Jesus do mighty deeds. They had heard him teach with authority. They had seen him have compassion upon people, They had listened to his authoritative words. He talked like no other. And so they believed Jesus to be a prophet. Now this was a true and accurate understanding of Jesus. Jesus had himself prophesying of his coming death in Jerusalem, mentioned his role as a prophet. We can look at that in Luke 13, 33, where he said, Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. It cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. He was looking forward to his death in Jerusalem as a prophet of God. And these disciples also indicate that they at least had been reminded, again, that Jesus had prophesied that he would raise in three days. Because they mentioned that it now was the third day. And yet, 
They hadn't quite yet believed the resurrection. But they believed him to be a prophet. Maybe they remembered the words that God had given to Moses back in Deuteronomy 18, 18, when it says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, like Moses, from among their brothers. And this is talking about the coming Messiah, about Jesus. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. Jesus would be the living word of God. So these disciples believe the true identity about Jesus, and they tell this stranger about Jesus. And then they mention that they had hoped him to be the redeemer of Israel. This had been their hope, that he would actually be the Messiah. And these disciples, they understood that redemption was necessary. Now, in a political sense, redemption denotes liberation and rescue. But redemption comes at a cost. It needs to be bought or, or won. And redemption also carries that understanding that there was a price to be paid. Now, it's most likely that these disciples were looking forward to more of that political redemption. For Jesus to be that Messiah who would overthrow Rome and set up the kingdom. But as saints whose hope were in God, they would have also been looking for spiritual redemption. A nation to be turned back to God. But in their mention of redemption, there is an understanding that a price had to be paid for sin, and yet they didn't quite understand that yet. A holy one needed to come to redeem the people. But these disciples missed the necessity for the suffering sacrifice, for the price that the Savior, the Messiah, would have to pay. And so now their hopes are kind of dashed. They hope for it, but now it's all over. Jesus died. The one most likely to be the Messiah did not bring the redemption. He had been crucified, so that is why they are in sorrow. And to confuse matters more, they tell this stranger about the tomb that is now empty and the women who had given the report of the angels and the message of the angels. And also that other disciples, it's most likely we have accounts of Peter and Peter and John going there, but it is possible that quite a few other disciples went and looked. And so they say, you know, there's, there are others of our company. They went down there and they looked and it, they found it empty, but him they did not see. They still had doubt because they had not seen Jesus. And you know what Jesus does at this particular point as these disciples are recounting this, he simply walks along and listens to them. He knows all of this. They had plenty of time. We don't know how long it took them to recount these things to Jesus. And Jesus walks along and he listens to these two disciples as they recount what had taken place, even their hope that they had in this this man, this one who they had hoped to be a Messiah. And we really learn a few things from Jesus' silence. One is just simply his compassion. He had the solution, but he takes time to listen. And you know what? God is often patient with us, is he not, in a very similar way? He's compassionate. He takes time to listen. If you need proof, go to the Psalms. How often does the psalmist cry out to God and God listens? He's patient, right? He's the sovereign one. He has all the answers. And yet, often he just wants to listen. He wants us to talk. He wants us to consider the things that we know, the things that he has revealed to us to be true. He created us to have a relationship with him. He's not just a cosmic authority that gives us a to-do list and leaves us alone. He actually enters into our sorrow. He listens to us and then comforts as well. Very similar to what Jesus had done prior, right? What At the tomb of Lazarus. He knew he was about to raise Lazarus and yet he enters their sorrow. So he cares for us. We also learn from Jesus' silence that there's benefit and it's necessary for us to consider and to meditate and take time to think. Why did Jesus have these disciples recount everything he knew, everything they knew, so that they would consider and think? It would be a basis upon which he would do some teaching in a moment as well. And God has given each one of us an amazing ability to think, to reason, to consider. We're not always given black and white answers, even in Scripture. There's a lot of scripture that is wisdom. We have whole books that is wisdom literature. 
where we take the principles God has given us and then he asks us in wisdom to consider and to think and then to apply it to our given situation. And we do this uh, in faith, believing the Lord, trusting him. And so Jesus is leading these disciples to faith, but faith based upon truth that God has revealed, not just the evidence that is right before them. Now, Jesus is going to reveal himself to them in just a few hours, but their faith needed to be on the faithfulness of God in his word. Not just an experience. So it's good for us to simply take time with Jesus to consider him and his truths that we find in his word. He wants us to meditate on him. Take time to be with him. So we consider Jesus, but we also must learn from Jesus, verses 25 through 27. And after hearing these disciples' perspective and all that took place, now it's time for Jesus to speak. They finish telling Jesus, verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary? Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? and enter into his glory. And then, to answer his own question, verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus first rebukes them for their unbelief. For their unbelief of the scriptures, basically, you believe that Jesus was a prophet? That's good yet you are slow to believe him and what he prophesied about. Also, what about all the prophets of God before him? Do you believe them? Jesus goes on, basically says, did not the prophets make it clear that the Christ, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the one that you hoped in, didn't the prophets make it clear that he would have to suffer just as you described this Jesus of Nazareth suffering, and then enter into his glory, doesn't resurrection fit that? As he's exalted as Lord over all. So after rebuking them, Jesus then revealed himself to them and they believed. No, that's not what he did. It seems like a good time to do that, though. But he doesn't. What happens? And this is, I mean, this is beautiful because Jesus, rather than just saying, hey, yes, you can believe me, he goes and says, all right, let's start with Moses and the prophetic writings, and then let's look at the whole of the Old Testament. Let me tell you about this Jesus of Nazareth. Let me tell you about myself. Now, remember, he doesn't have the New Testament, so he's using the Old Testament. And so he goes to the scriptures and he reveals how the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer these things and then enter into glory. And he explains the truth of God's word to them. He uses the word of God. And this really should be a beautiful encouragement for us today because Jesus was saying in that moment that God's word, it is true, it's living, it's powerful, it's personal, and it can bring about faith. Jesus appealed to the written word of God. And you know what that tells us? That whether it's on your phone or a hard copy in your hands, you are holding the living communication of God to you. Not only can you trust it, but when you open it and you hear from it, you are hearing the very voice of God. You don't need a vision. You don't need an experience. You don't need a new revelation. You need simply to hear from God and then believe him. You know, too often we are worried, we are concerned, misinformed, unbelieving, but we have left his word on open. We have gotten the notification, but we haven't looked at the text yet. If you're like me, that's one of my problems. My phone all, ding, I got a message. It's there, it's a red circle. I know I got a message. I need to look at that. Guess who forgets to look at it? And then later, the person who texted me says, uh, hey, hey, did you get my text? And I'll say, yeah, I got your text. Let me look and see what you said. I never opened it. I had it. I didn't look at it. Do we have the message from God? Yes. Do 
you know and believe what it says? Have we opened that message? Do we believe that message? And so Jesus, he rebukes these disciples. They knew the message, but they didn't believe it. And they kind of missed some parts. Even when they saw it come to pass before them. So Jesus takes them on a journey through the Old Testament and shows them how the scripture was all about him. That's something we need to understand. Even about the Old Testament, it's all about Jesus. At least it's pointing to him. It's pointing to him. There are many different parts and different parts that talk about different things, but the main storyline is pointing towards the cross. It's pointing to Jesus. Now, it would have been great, but Luke doesn't actually tell us what Jesus said along that road as they walked towards Emmaus. But what he did communicate is the word of God and why it was necessary for the suffering and the exaltation of the Messiah. Basically, he presented the gospel from the Old Testament. That's what Jesus did. The necessity of the Messiah to suffer is first seen in the opening chapters of Scripture. We will not, because Jesus probably didn't even have time to look at every passage of Scripture. He was giving them a general overview, most likely, of what they had known. They were Jews. They understood the, many of the prophecies and the main stories in the Old Testament. And so he would have given them a general overview of these things and why it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and then rise again. And so we'll just do that really quickly. And it starts at the opening chapters of Scripture. God created humans in his image, right? To represent him on earth and to live in fellowship with him. But humans went their own way, rebelled against God. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, rebelled against God. And now all are born as sinners. And God drove sinful man out of his holy presence and he pronounced a judgment upon them, a judgment of death. Separation from that fellowship and the blessings of God. It was a good and righteous judgment against our wickedness. And yet God also promised that a Messiah would come, one who would save his people by his victory over the evil one. And that's where we come to Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise your head. It was a fatal blow. Uh, Crush your head. Uh, He shall crush the head of, of Satan and you shall bruise his heel. One would come who would bear the judgment of God against sin on himself so that sinners could be forgiven and reconciled to God. And then you have the history of Israel. And the history of Israel was God preparing the way for the Messiah. And God made it clear in the law that no one was righteous. No one could be reconciled to him by their own efforts. Psalm 14.3, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. The law also pictured the necessity of a substitution, a sacrifice on behalf of sinners. That's why we read about in Leviticus 17.11 that the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins. But also the blood of bulls and goats, they were insufficient. They needed to be offered continually. And yet there would be a holy one, one who would die for the sins of the people. One who would be judged by the wrath of God in place of sinners. Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs in verse 4 and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions in verse 5. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. It was evident that neither Israel nor the Gentile nations could reconcile themselves to God. And yet God continued to promise a Messiah, a way to him. It would have been necessary then for this Messiah to suffer these things. The Old Testament made that clear. But the Old Testament also made clear that the Messiah would be the coming king. He would be the coming ruler whose kingdom would last forever. This was promised to David and then again to Solomon. And then Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So the Messiah would also be exalted to the position of king over all forever. And so the only way these two concepts of a dying Savior and an exalted King could be true was for the Messiah to be raised from the dead and then enter into his glory. So Jesus says, Have you not seen how the Messiah 
needed to suffer these things and then be exalted into glory? It's all throughout the Old Testament. That's what it's about. It's about him. That leads us to ask this question, how do we approach Scripture? Because you know what? We are tempted to approach Scripture a little bit in the way the disciples here had done for their benefit. Now, there's great blessings for God's people. We don't want to miss that. But truthfully, they had hope for the redemption of Israel, and they were looking more politically. They had missed the spiritual necessity of a Messiah. And truthfully, sometimes you and I, we can approach Scripture thinking that it's kind of all about us, how we could have a better life, how we should live, how we could get wisdom so that we can make our daily decisions. We kind of approach it looking for the next pick-me-up or the motivational nugget, the proverbial wisdom that we can post on social media or take with us throughout the day. When instead, we need to approach Scripture the way Jesus approached Scripture, as a revelation of himself. It is first and foremost about him. If you leave your time in God's word and you only walk away with a way to have a better life, or something you need to do, or a motivation for the day, you've missed the primary message of the passage you read. So look for this in your time in God's Word. Mark it down, whether it's in Scripture or a journal, whatever it might be. Highlight it. Consider, what does the passage I'm reading tell me about God and my Savior? And once you can see God in the passage that you are reading, then the wisdom, the commands, the blessings, these are simply responses then to God. It's no longer about us, but it's all about him. So do we gain wisdom? Yes. Are there blessings? Indeed. Does it give us a way to live a godly life? Yes. Does it provide motivation and encouragement? Absolutely. Absolutely but it doesn't do it just because it sounds good. It actually does it because we know God. And it's a way we respond to him. So what have we seen so far about Jesus? Because that's who we have to see in this passage. Well, we see his compassion. We have already seen his compassion for people. We have seen that he is the Messiah, the one who had to suffer and die and rise again. We've even seen that in the Old Testament. We see that he is exalted, that he is raised from the dead. He's about to reveal himself to these disciples. We will look at that in a moment. And we see that he is the word of God and that what he said and what he did, it agreed with and fulfilled the written word of God. That's the Savior we serve. And so it's from these truths that we are are moved to respond by believing the word of God. Today, we're not going to leave our time together and have Jesus walk with us along the road to our homes and explain scripture to us. But we have his word. And we have his spirit that gives us interpretation. If you want to walk with Jesus and hear from him, simply take a passage with you and go for a walk. Meditate on it. Talk to him about it. Discuss it with him. Pray through it. If you want to have coffee with Jesus, Pour yourself a cup of coffee and listen to his voice in the pages of scripture. You want him to comfort you in the night when you can't sleep? Then meditate upon the word of God. And if you have yet to believe that Jesus died for you and rose again so that you could have the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life and reconciliation with him for eternity, then look to the truths of what we're looking at this morning, that there was a Messiah who did these things for you so that when you repent of your sins and place your faith in him alone as your Lord and Savior, he'll save you, and you'll be his for eternity. So we want to consider Jesus. We must also learn from Jesus. And then once we're convinced and convicted, or convinced of him in faith, then we proclaim Jesus, verses 28 through 35. Jesus, we don't know how much time he took, how much time was left 
after they told him things, but he took that time to tell them about himself in the Old Testament. And so verse 28, so they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he was going to go further, and Jesus was going to go on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. It was time to rest for the night. Pretty soon travel would be more perilous. And so he went in to stay with them, probably in their home, or at least one of their homes there in Emmaus. And they provide a meal for him. Verse 30, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Now, it was customary for the host, of the meal to break the bread and give thanks to God. Uh, why Jesus did this or was given this honor, we don't know specifically. Maybe Jesus just took that responsibility upon himself, or it's perhaps that they recognized him as a great teacher and so gave him the honor of blessing the, the meal and breaking the bread for distribution. And as he did this, verse 31, then their eyes were open and they recognized him. The divine concealing of Jesus' identity was lifted and they realized who he was. And then he vanished from their sight. Look at their response. And the conversation begins again between the two disciples and they said to one another, verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? And then when? while he opened to us the scriptures. Why did Jesus hide his identity for some time? They needed to know and be convinced of God's word. It was the truth of God's word as it came to be known and understood that moved their souls. Yes, Jesus was the teacher, but it was the living word of God that moved them. And so here's the response that they have after seeing Jesus and believing God's word. Here's how they respond. Verse 33, and they rose that same hour and they returned to Jerusalem. Any consideration about it becoming evening, maybe, you know, more perilous to journey, that didn't matter. They had, you know, seven miles and we're going to go back to Jerusalem. And when they get there, it's probably now late. They found the 11 and those who are with them gathered together. And here's what the disciples in Jerusalem were doing up so late. Verse 34, they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Peter. Now we're never given the details of the encounter between Jesus and Peter, though it is attested that he did appear to Peter. So now the disciples had not only the witness of Peter, but of, at this point, it would be Mary Magdalene, the other women as well that had seen Jesus at this point. And now to add to the witness, these two disciples show up, and verse 35, they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So what is the response of those who have spent time with Jesus and the word of God? Confident proclamation. And this really is our response as well because we've seen Jesus today. We have seen that he is alive. We have seen that the the whole of God's word, it's about him. We we have seen that in, in hearing from the word of God, we actually hear from God himself. We have spent time then this morning with God. So we must let the truth of God's word, the knowledge of our Savior, then move us to joy, just as these disciples had, and also proclamation. And here's the amazing thing. You and I, we're not Jesus. But we can boldly proclaim the message of God just as Jesus did. What did Jesus share with them? The written word of God. And we can do this as well when we proclaim the written word of God. The living, the powerful, the personal word of God. Maybe the reason why we don't proclaim Jesus so often is simply because we have not spent time with him and his word. Maybe we know a lot about the Bible. Maybe we even know how we as a Christian should live. But we've not really actually spent time with our Savior. If this is a challenge to you, then maybe this week, set aside your normal devotions as what you would normally do. Instead, take the passage that you are going to read or maybe read a chapter from the Gospel of Luke 
and simply talk through it with Jesus. Spend time with him. Praise him for how he has revealed himself in his word. Delight in him. And then you know what? Go ahead and find somebody to tell that to. That might be an unbeliever and you're sharing the gospel, but it might be a believer in your own home. Share it with somebody you know. Share it with somebody in the church. Tell others about Jesus. That's part of us meeting together as a church is to share with one another what we know about and delight in about our Savior. It's what we do on Wednesday nights. We always take a time to tell each other about Jesus. So come and tell us about Jesus. We want to hear from you. We can have confidence in our message about Jesus when we're sharing the word of God, for God speaks through his word. So spend time with the word of God, the written word of God and the living word of God. And we have done that today. So now may we bring others into his presence through our proclamation of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is living, it's powerful, it's personal. It reveals you to us. It's you speaking to us. And Lord, in the pages that we looked at this morning, we have seen Jesus, our living Savior. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for his compassion and mercy. We thank you for his death, his burial, and then his exaltation through which we have confident assurance that we are your people and we'll be with you for eternity. May we be bold in our proclamation of you, Lord. We thank you that we have your word, that it doesn't have to be us, that we can present the very same things that Jesus presented because they come from you. Give us confidence, give us boldness, give us compassion that we'd reflect Jesus well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.